All right, don't have a ton of time, so we're just gonna jump right in. Love in the Time of Cholera, chapter six. So we're getting to the home stretch here. All right, page 279. Fermina Daza could not have imagined that her letter, inspired by blind rage, would have been interpreted by Florentina Ariza as a love letter. She had put it into all the she had put into it all of the fury of which she ha was capable. Her cruelest words, most wounding, most unjust vilifications, which still seemed minuscule to her in light of the enormity of the offense. It was the final act in a bitter exorcism through which she was attempting to come to terms with her new situation. She wanted to be herself again, to recover all that she had been obliged to give up in half a century of servitude that had doubtless made her happy, but which, once her husband was dead, did not leave her even the vestiges of her, of her identity. She was a ghost in a strange house that overnight had become immense and solitary, and through which she wandered without purpose, asking herself in anguish which of them was deader, the man who had died or the woman he had left behind. She could not avoid a profound feeling of rancor toward her husband for having left her alone in the middle of the ocean. Everything of this made her cry. His, his, everything of his made her cry. His pajamas under the pillow, his slippers that had always looked to her like an invalid, the memory of his image in the back of the mirror as he undressed while she combed her hair before bed, the odor of his skin, which was to linger on hers for a long time after his death. She would stop in the middle of whatever she was doing and slap herself on the forehead because she suddenly remembered something she had forgotten to tell him. At every moment, countless ordinary questions would come to mind that he alone could answer for her. Once he had told her something that she could not imagine, that amputees suffer pain, cramps, itches in the leg that is no longer there. That is how she felt without him, feeling his presence where he no longer was. When she awoke on her first morning as a widow, she turned over in bed without opening her eyes, searching for a more comfortable position so that she could continue sleeping, and that was the moment when he died for her. For only then did it become clear that he had spent the night away from home for the first time in years. The other place where this struck her was at the table, not because she felt alone, which in fact she was, but because of her strange belief that she was eating with someone who no longer existed. It was not until her daughter Ophelia came from New Orleans with her husband and the three girls that sat at the table again to eat, but instead of the usual one, she ordered a smaller improvised table set up in the corridor. Until then, she did not take a regular meal. She would walk through the kitchen at any hour whenever she was hungry and put her fork in the pots and eat a little of everything without placing anything on a plate. Standing in front of the stove, talking to the servant women, who were the only ones with whom she felt comfortable, the ones she got along with best. Still, no matter how hard she tried, she could not elude the presence of her dead husband. Wherever she went, wherever she turned, no matter what she was doing, she would come across something of his that would remind her of him. For even though it seemed only decent and right to grieve for him, she also wanted to do everything possible not to wallow in her grief. And so she made the drastic decision to empty the house of everything that would remind her of her de dead husband, which was the only way she could think of to go on living without him. It was a ritual of eradication. Her son agreed to take his library so that she could replace his office with the sewing room she had never had when she was married, and her daughter would take some furniture and countless objects that she thought were just right for the antique auctions in New Orleans. All of this was a relief for Fermina Daza, for although she was... Uh, although she was not at all amused to learn that the things she had bought on her honeymoon were now relics for antiquarians. <laughs> to the silent stup stupefaction of the servants, the neighbors, the women friends who came to visit during her, visit her during that time, she had a bonfire built in a vacant lot behind the house, and there she burned everything that remained her, her of her dead husband. The most expensive and elegant clothes seen in the city since the last century, the finest shoes, the hats that resembled him more than his portraits, portraits, the siesta rocking chair from which he had arisen for the last time to die, innumerable objects so tied to her life that by now they formed part of her identity. She did it without the shadow of a doubt, in the full certainty that her husband would have approved, and not only for reasons of hygiene. For he had often expressed his desire to be cremated and not shut away in the seamless dark of a cedar box. His religion would not permit it, of course. He had dared to broach the subject with the archbishop, just in case, and his answer had been a categorical no. 
It was pure illusion, because the church did not permit the existence of crematoriums in our cemeteries, not even for the use of religions other than Catholic, and the advantage of building them would not have occurred to anyone but Juvenal Urbino. Fermina Daza did not forget her husband's terror and even the confusion of the first hour she remembered to order the carpenter to leave a chink where, she, where light could come into the coffin as a consolation to him. In any event, the Holocaust was in vain. In a very short while, uh, in a very short while, Fermina Daza realized that the memory of her dead husband was as resistant to the fire as it seemed to be to the passage of time. Even worse, after the incineration of his clothing, she continued to miss not only the many things she had loved in him, but also what had most annoyed her, the noises he made on arising. The memory helped her to escape the mangroves, mangrove swamps of grief. Above all else, she made the firm decision to go on with her life, remembering her husband as if he had not died. She knew that walking, that waking each morning would continue to be difficult, but it would, not, but it would become less and less so. At the end of the third week, in fact, she began to see the first light. But as it grew larger and brighter, she became aware that there was an evil phantom in her life who did not give her a moment's peace. He was not the pitiable phantom who had haunted her in the park of the Evangels and whom she had evoked with a certain tenderness after he, she had grown old, but the hateful phantom which, with his executioner's frock coat and his hat held against his chest, whose thoughtless impertinence had disturbed her so much that she found it impossible not to think about him. Ever since her rejection of him at the age of 18, she had been convinced that she had left behind a seed of hatred in him that could only grow larger with time. She had always counted on that hatred. She felt it in the air when the phantom was near, and the mere sight of him had upset and frightened her so that she never found a natural way to behave with him. On the night when he reiterated his love for her, while the flowers for her dead husband were still perfuming in the house, she could not believe that his insolence was not the first step in God's... First step in God... She could not believe that his insolence was not the first step in God's knows what sinister plan for revenge. And God knows. Okay. Uh, her persistent memory of him increased, increased her rage. When she awoke thinking about him on the day after the funeral, she succeeded in removing him from her thoughts by a simple act of will. But the rage always returned, and she realized very soon that the desire to forget him was the strongest inducement for remembering him. Then, overcome by nostalgia, she dared to recall for the first time the illusory days of that unreal love. She tried to remember just how the little park was then, and the shabby almond trees, and the bench where he had loved her, because none of it still existed as it had been then. They had changed everything. They had removed the trees with their carpet of yellow leaves and replaced the statue of the decapitated hero with that of another, who wore his dress uniform but had no name or dates or reasons to justify him, and who stood on an ostentatious pedestal in which they had installed the electrical controls for the district. Her house, sold many years before, had fallen into total ruin at the hands of the provin provincial government. It was not easy for her to imagine Florentino Ariza as he had been then, much less to believe that the tad taciturn boy, so vulnerable in the rain, was the moth-eaten old wreck who had stood in front of her with no consideration for her situation or the slightest respect for her grief, and had seared her soul with a flaming insult that still made it difficult for her to breathe. Cousin Hildebrand de Sanchez had come to visit a short while after Fermina Daza returned from the ranch in Floresta Maria, where she had gone to recuperate from the misfortune of Miss Lynch. Old, fat, and contented, she had arrived in the company of her oldest son, who, like his father, had been a colonel in the army, army, but had been repudiated by him because of his contemptible behavior during the massacre of the banana workers in San Juan de la Cienaga. The two cousins saw each other often and spent endless hours feel feeling nostalgia for the time when they first met. On her last visit, Hildebrando was more nostalgic than ever, and very affected by the burden of old age. In order to add even greater poignancy to their memories, she had brought her copy of the portrait of them dressed as old-fashioned ladies, taken by the Belgian photographer on the afternoon that a young Hudnel Urbino had decided the coup de grace to a wolfer. Uh, delivered the coup de grace to a willful, willful Fermina Daza. Her copy of the photograph had been lost, and Hildebrando's was almost invisible, but they could both recognize themselves through the mist of dis disenchantment, young and beautiful as they would never be again. 
For Hildebranda, it was impossible not to speak of Florentuna Oriza because she always identified his fate with her own. She evoked him as she evoked the day she had sent her first telegram, and she could never erase her heart fr the, from her heart the memory of the sad little bird contemned to obliv oblivion. For her part, Fermina had often seen him without speaking to him. Of course, she could not imagine that he had been her first love. She always heard news about him, as sooner or later she heard news about anyone of any signif significance in the city. It was said that she had not married because of his unusual habits, but she paid no attention to this, in part because she never paid attention to rumors, and in part because such things were said in any event about men who were above suspicion. On the other hand, it seemed strange to her that Florentino Arizzo would persist in his mystic attire and his rare lotions, and that he would continue to be so enigmatic after making his way in life in so spectacular and honorable a manner. It was impossible for her to believe he was the same person, and she was always surprised when Hildebrando would sigh, Poor man, how he, how he must have suffered. For she had seen him without grief for a long time, a shadow that had been obliterated. Nevertheless, on the night she met him in the movie theater just after her return from Flores de Maria, something strange occurred in her heart. She was not surprised that he was with a woman and a black woman at that. What did surprise her was that he was so well-preserved that he behaved with the great, greatest self-assurance, and it did not occur to her that perhaps it was she, not he, who had changed after the troubling explosion of Miss Lynch in her private life. From then on, and for many, more than twenty years, she saw him with no more compassionate eyes. Is that the page I'm on? With, with more compassionate eyes, not no more. With more compassionate eyes. On the night of the vigil for her, for her husband, it not only seemed reasonable for him for, to be be there, but she even understood it as the natural end of rancor, an act of forgiving and forgetting. That was why she was so taken aback by this, by his dramatic reiteration of love for her that had never existed. At an age when Florentino Ariza and she could expect nothing more from life. The mortal rage of the first shock remained intact after the symbolic cremation of her husband, and it grew and spread as she felt herself less capable of controlling it. Even worse, the spaces in her mind where she managed to appease her memories of the dead man were slowly but inexorably being taken over by the field of poppies where she had buried the memories of Florentino Ariza. And so she thought about him without wanting to. The more she thought about him, the angrier she became, and the angrier she became, the more she thought about him, until it was something so unbearable that her mind could no longer contain it. Then she sat down at her dead hus husband's desk and wrote Florentino Ariza a letter consisting of three irrational pages, so full of insults and base provocations that it brought her the consolation of consciously committing the vilest act of her long life. Those weeks had been agonizing for Florentino Ariza as well. The night he reiterated his love to Fermina Daza, he had wandered aimlessly through streets that had been devastated by the afternoon flood, asking himself in terror what he was going to do with the skin of the tiger he had just killed after having resisted his attacks for more than, a, than half a century. The city was in a state of emergency because of the violent rains. In some houses, half-naked men and women were trying to salvage whatever God willed from the flood, and Florentino Ariza had the impression that everyone's calamity had something to do with his own. But the wind was calm, and the stars of the Caribbean were quiet in their places. In the sudden silence of other voices, Florentino Ariza recognized the voice of the man whom Leo Leona Cassiani and he had heard singing many years before, at the same hour and on the same corner. I came back from the bridge bathed in tears, a song that in some way on that night for him alone had something to do with death. He needed Transito Oriza then as he never had before. He needed her wise words, her head of a mock queen adorned with paper flowers. He could not avoid it. Whenever he found himself on the edge of catastrophe, he needed the help of a woman so that he passed by the normal school, seeking out those who were within reach, and he saw a light in the long rows of windows in America Vicuña's dormitory. He had to make a great effort not to fall into the grandfather's madness of carrying her off at two o'clock in the morning, 
warm with sleep in her swaddling clothes and still smelling of the cradle's tantrums. At the other end of the city was Leona Cassiani, alone and free and doubtless ready to provide him with the compassion he needed at two o'clock in the morning, at three o'clock, at any hour, and under any circumstances. It would not be the first time he had knocked at her door in the wasteland of his sleepless nights, but he knew that she was too intelligent and that they loved each other too much for him to come crying to her lap and not tell her the reason. After a good deal of thought, as he sleepwalked through the deserted city, it occurred to him that he could do no better than Prudencia Pitre, the widow of two, who was younger than he. Then had well, they had first met in the last century, and if they stopped meeting, it was because she refused to allow anyone to see her as she was, half blind and verging on decrepitude. Or decrepitude, not decrepitude, <laughs> decrepitude. Uh, as soon as he thought of her, Florentina Ariza returned to the street of the windows, put two bottles of port and a jar of pickles in a shopping bag, and went to visit her, not even knowing if she was still in her old house, if she was alone, or if she was alive. Um, near the bottom of 285. Prudencia Pitre had not forgotten his scratching signal at the door the one he had used to identify himself when they thought they were still young although they were no they although, uh, although they no longer were and she opened the door without any questions the street was dark and he was barely visible in his black suit his stiff hat and his bat's umbrella hanging over his arm and her eyes were too weak to see him except in full light but she recognized him by the gleam of the street lamp on the metal frame of his eyeglasses he looks like a murderer with blood still on his hands. Sanctuary for a poor orphan, he said. It was the only thing he could think of to say, just to say something. He was surprised at how much she had aged since the last time he saw her, and he was aware that she saw him the same way. But he consoled himself by thinking in that moment, when they had both re recovered from the initial shock, they would notice fewer and fewer of the blows that life had dealt the other, and they would again seem as young as they had been when they first met. You look as if you were going to a funeral, she said. It was true. She, along with almost the entire city, had been at the window since 11 o'clock watching the largest and most sumptuous funeral procession that had been seen here since the death of Archbishop de Luna. She had been awakened from her siesta by the thundering artillery that made the earth tremble, by the dissonances of the marching bands, the confusion of funeral hymns over the clamoring bells in all the churches, which had been ringing without pause since the previous day. From her balcony, she had seen the cal cavalry in dress uniform, the religious communities, the schools, the long black limousines of an invisible officialdom, the carriage drawn by horses in feathered headdresses and gold trappings, the flag draped yellow coffin on the gun carriage, of a historic cannon, and at the very end of a line of old open Victorias that kept themselves alive in order to carry funeral re funeral wreaths. wreaths. As soon as they had passed by Prudencia Pitre's balcony, a little after midday, the deluge came and the funeral procession dispersed into a wild stampede. What an absurd way to die, she said. Death has no sense of the ridiculous, he said, and, and added in sorrow, and added in sorrow, above all at our age. Grim. They were seated on the terrace, facing the open sea, looking at the ringed moon that took up half the sky, looking at the colored lights of the boats along the horizon, enjoying the mild, perfumed breeze after the storm. They drank port and ate pickles on slices of country bread that Prudencia Pitre cut from a loaf in the kitchen. They spent many nights like this after she had been left a widow without children. Florentino Ariza had met her at a time when she would, would have received any man who wanted to be with her, even if he were hired by the hour, and they had established a relationship that was more serious and longer lived than would have seemed possible. Although she never even hinted at it, she would have sold her soul to the devil to marry him. She knew that it would not be easy to submit to his miser miserliness or the foolishness of his premature appearance of age, or his maniacal sense of order, or his eagerness to ask for everything and give nothing at all in return, 
But despite all this, no man was better company because no other man in the world was so in need of love. But no other man was as elusive either, so that their love never went beyond the point it was always beyond the point it always reached for them, for him, the point where it would not inter interfere with his determination to remain free for Formina Daza. Nevertheless, it lasted many years, even after he had arranged for Prudencia Pritre to marry a salesman who was home for three months and traveled for the next three, and with whom she had a daughter and four sons, one of whom she swore was Florentino Ariza's. They talked, not concerned about the hour, because both were accustomed to sharing the sleepless nights of their youth, and they had much less to lose in the sleeplessness of old age. Although he almost never had more than two glasses of wine, uh, Florentino Ariza still had not caught his breath after the third. He was dripping with perspiration, and the win widow of two told him to take off his jacket, his vest, his trousers, to take off everything if he liked. What the hell? After all, they knew each other better naked than dressed. He said he would if she did the same, but she refused. Some time ago, she had looked herself in the mirror, wardrobe mirror and suddenly realized that she would no longer have the courage to allow anyone, not him, not anyone, to see her undressed. Oh, sad. Florentino Ariza, in a state of agitation that he could not calm with four glasses of port, talked at length about the same subject, the past, the good memories from the past, for he was desperate to find the hidden road in the past, that would bring him relief, for that was what he needed to let his soul escape through his mouth. What he saw when he saw the first light of the dawn on the horizon, he attempted an indirect approach. He asked in a way that seemed casual, "What would you do if someone proposed proposed marriage to you, just as you are, a widow of your age?" She laughed with a wrinkled old woman's laugh and asked in turn, "Are you speaking of the widow Urbino?" Florentino Riza always forgot when he should not have that women, and Prudencia Pitre more than other, always think about the hidden meanings of questions more than about the questions themselves. Filled with sudden terror because of her chilling marks marksmanship, he slipped through the back door. I'm speaking of you! She laughed again. Go make fun of your bitch of a mother. May she rest in peace. Then she urged him to say what he meant to say, because she knew that he or any other man would not have awakened her at three o'clock in the morning after so many years of not seeing her just to drink port and eat country bread with pickles. She said, you do that only when you are looking for someone to cry with. Florentino Ariza withdrew in defeat. For once you are wrong, he said, my reasons tonight have more to do with singing. Let's sing then, she said. And she began to sing in a very good voice, the song that was popular then, Romana, I cannot live without you. The night was over, for he did not dare to play forbidden games with a woman who had prov proven too many times that she knew the dark side of the moon. He walked out into a different city, one that was perfumed by the last dahlias of June, and onto a street of his youth where the shadowy windows from five o'clock mass were filing by. But now it was he, not they, who crossed the street, so they would not see the tears he could no longer hold back, not his midnight tears, as he thought, but other tears, the ones that had been swallowed, he had been swallowing for 51 years, 9 months, and 4 days. He had lost all track of time and did not know where he was when he wo awoke facing a large, dazzling window. The voice of America Vicuña playing ball in the garden with the servant girls brought him back to reality. He was in his mother's bed. He had kept her bedroom intact, and he would sleep there to feel less alone in the few occasions where he was troubled by his solitude. Across from the bed hung the large mirror from Don San Sancho's inn, and he had only to see it when he awoke to see Fermina Daza reflected in its depths. He knew that it was Saturday, because that was the day the chauffeur picked up America Vicuña at her boarding school and brought her back to his house. He realized that he had slept without knowing it, dreaming that he could not sleep, in a dream that had been disturbed by the wrathful face of Fermina Daza. He bathed, wondering what his next step should be. He dressed very slowly in his best clothing. He dabbed on cologne and waxed the ends of his white mustache. He left the bedroom, and from the second floor hallway, he saw the beautiful child of her uniform catching the ball with the grace that had made him tremble on so many Saturdays, but this morning did not disquiet him in the least. He indicated that she should come with him, and before he climbed into the automobile, he said, although it was not necessary, 
Today we are not going to do our things. He took her to the American ice cream shop, filled at this hour with parents eating ice cream with their children along the, the under the long blades of the fans that hung from the smooth smooth ceiling. America Vucunia ordered an enormous glass glass filled with layers of ice cream, each a different color. Her favorite dish and the one that was most popular because it gave off an aura of magic. Florentino Ariza drank black coffee and looked at the girl without speaking, while she ate the, the ice cream with a spoon that had a very long handle so that one could reach the bottom of the glass. Still looking at her, he said without warning, I am going to marry. She looked into his eyes with a flash of uncertainty, her spoon suspended in midair, but then she recovered and smiled. That's a lie, she said. Old men don't marry. That afternoon, she le left at her school under a steady downpour, just as the Angelus was ringing, after two of them had watched the puppet show in the park, had lunch at the fried fish stands on the jetties, seen the caged animals in the circus that had just come to town, bought all kinds of candies at the outdoor stalls to take back to school, and driven around the city several times with the top town so that she could become accustomed to the idea that he was her guardian and no longer her lover. It's a big afternoon. And yay, no more rape. Okay. Um, on Sunday, he sent the automobile for her in the event she wanted to take a drive with her friends, but he did not want to see her because since the previous week he had come to full consciousness of both their ages. That night, he decided to write a letter of apology to Fermina Daza, its only purpose to show that he had not given up, but if he put it off until the next day. On Monday, after exactly three weeks of agony, he walked into his house soaked by the rain, rain and found her letter. Bottom of 289. It was eight o'clock at night. The two servant girls were in bed, and they had left on the light in the hallway that lit Florentino Ariza's way to his bedroom. He knew that his Spartan, bland supper was on the table in the dining room, but the slight hunger he felt after so many days of haphazard eating vanished with the emotional upheaval of the letter. His hands were shaking so much that it was difficult for him to, over to turn on the overhead light in the bedroom. He put the rain-soaked letter on the bed, lit the lamp on the night table, and with the feigned tranquility that was his customary way of calming himself, he took off his wet jacket and hung it on the back of, his, of the chair. He took off his vest, folded it with care, and placed it on top of the jacket. He took off his black silk string tie and the celluloid collar that was no longer fashionable in the world. He unbuttoned his shirt down to his waist and loosened his belt so that he could breathe with greater ease. And at last, he took off his hat and put it by the window to dry. Then he began to tremble because he did not know where the letter was, and his nervous excitement was so great that he was surprised when he found it, for he did not remember placing it on the bed. Before opening it, he dried the envelope with his handkerchief, taking care not to smear the ink in which his name was written, and as he did, it, did so, it occurred to him that the secret was no longer shared by two people, but by three at least, for whoever had delivered it must have noticed that only three weeks after the death of her husband, the widow Urbino was writing to someone who did not belong to her world, and with so much urgency that she did not use the regular mails, and so much secretive secretiveness that she had ordered that it not be handed to anyone, but slipped under the door instead, as if it were an anonymous letter. He did not have to tear open the envelope, for the water had dissolved the glue, but the letter was dry closely written pages with no salutation and signed with the initials of her married name. He sat on the bed and read it through only uh, uh, read it through once quickly as he could, more intrigued by the tone than by the content. And before he reached the second page, he knew that it was in fact the insulting letter he had expected to receive. He laid it unfolded in the light shed by the bed, bed lamp. He took off his shoes and his wet socks. He turned out the overhead light using the switch next to the door and at last he put on his chamois he put on his chamois mustache cover got a cover for your mustache that was confusing to me um and lay down without removing his trousers and shirt he, his head supported by two large pillows that he used as a backrest for reading now he read it again, this time syllable by syllable, scrutinizing each so that none of the letter's secret intentions would be hidden from him. 
and then he read it four more times until he was so full of the written words that they began to lose all meaning. He, at last he placed it without the envelope in the drawer of the night table, lay on his back with his hands behind his head, and for four hours he did not blink. He hardly breathed. He was more dead than a dead man. As he stared into the space in the mirror where she had been, as he stared into the space in the mirror where she had been. Precisely at midnight, he went to the kitchen and prepared a thermos of coffee as thick as crude oil, and he took it to his room, put his false teeth into the glass of boric acid solution that he always found ready for him on the night table, and resumed the posture of an recumbent marble statue, with momentary shifts in position when he took a sip of coffee until the maid came in at six o'clock with a fresh thermos. Florentino Ariza knew by then what one of his next steps was going to be. In truth, the insults caused him no, no pain, and he was not concerned, concerned with rectifying the unjust accusations that could have been worse, considering Fermina Daza's character and the gravity of the cause. All that interested him was that the letter in and of itself gave him the opportunity and even recognized his right to respond. Even more, it demanded that he respond, so that life was now at the point where he had wanted it to be. Everything else depended on him, and he was convinced that his private hell of over half a century's duration would still present him with many mortal challenges, which he was prepared to confront with more ardor, ardor and more sor sorrow and more love than he had brought to any of them before now, because these would be the last. When he went to his office five days after receiving the letter from Fermina Daza, he felt as if he were floating in an abrupt and unusual absence of the noise. Yeah, he felt as if he were floating in an abrupt and unusual absence of the noise of the typewriters, whose sound, like rain, had become less noticeable than silence. It was a moment of calm. When the sound began again, Florentino Ariza went to Leona Cassiani's office and watched her as she sat in front of her own personal typewriter, which responded to her fingertips as if it were human. She knew she was being observed, and she looked toward the door with her awesome solar smile, but she did not stop typing until the end of the paragraph. "'Tell me something, lying lady of my soul,' asked Florentino Ariza. "'How would you feel if you received a love letter written on that thing?' Her expression, she who was no longer surprised at anything, was one of genuine surprise. My God, man, she exclaimed. It never occurred to me. For that very reason, she could make no other reply. Florentino Ariza had not thought of it either until that moment, and he decided to risk it with no reservations. He took one of the office typewriters home, his subordinates joke, joking good-naturedly. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. Leone Cassiani, enthusiastic about anything new, offered to give him typing lessons at home, but he had been opposed to methodical learning ever since Lotario Fugat had wanted to teach him to play the, the violin by reading notes, and warned him that he would need at least a year to begin, five more to qualify for a professional orchestra, and six hours a day for the rest of his life in order to play well. And yet he had convinced his mother to buy him a blind man's violin, and with the five basic rules given him by Lutario Fugat, in less than a year, he had dared to play in the choir of the cathedral and, uh, and to serenade Fermina Daza from the Pauper's Cemetery, according to the direction of the winds. If that had been the case at the age of 20, with something as difficult as the violin, he did not see why it could not also be the case at the age of 76, with a one-finger instrument like the typewriter. He was right. He needed three days to learn the position of the letters on the keyboard, another six to learn to think while he typed, and three more to complete the first letter without errors after tearing up half a ream of paper. He gave it a solemn salu salutation, Signora, Signora, and signed it with his initial, and as he had done in the perfumed love letters of his youth. He mailed it in an envelope with the morning vignettes that were de rigueur, were de rigueur. Oh, there must be regular for a letter to a recent widow, widow and with no return address on the back. It was a six page letter, unlike any he had ever written before. It did not have the tone or the style or the rhetor rhetorical air of his early years of love, and his argument was so rational and measured that the scent of a gardenia would have been out of place. In a certain sense, it was his closest approximation to the business letters he had never been able to write. 
Years later, a typed personal letter would be considered almost an insult, but at that time, the typewriter was still an office animal without its own code of ethics, and its domestication for personal use was not foreseen in the books on etiquette. It seemed more like bold modernity, which was how Fermina Daza must have understood it, for in her second letter to Florentino Reza, she began by begging his par pardon for any difficulties in reading her handwriting, since she did not have at her disposal any means more advanced than her steel pen. And we'll stop there, the top of 293. Sorry for the knock on the door.